role of reason in Islam, the ishtihad. Who is qualified to actually do ishtihad? Everybody who has, who has a sound reason and has an approach to, to the sources of the Quran by knowledge, thorough knowledge of the Arabic language and of the uh, methodology of uh, hadith and uh, sunnah and, and has the mental equipment for it, can, is entitled to exert jihad. Now, the question arises, of course, about people who haven't got that equipment and who have, therefore, to follow somebody. Ibn Hazm, the great Muslim scholar, uh, gives in the introduction to the, his main work, al Muhalla, a very good answer to this question. He says, if a man is absolutely ignorant, entirely ignorant and has no possibility of ascertaining himself through his exercise of ijtihad what the Islamic law is on a particular point or many points, he should seek out a person whom he regards as a scholar, as well-versed, and should ask him, what does the Islamic law, the Sharia, say on this point? After that learned man gives him the answer, he should ask him, the questioner should ask him again, have you got it from the Quran and the Sunnah or the Sunnah or from your own mind? If he says, I have got it from the Quran and the Sunnah in this form, hakeza, in this way, accept it and leave the responsibility to that particular scholar. If, on the other hand, that scholar says, no, I have arrived at this conclusion through deduction, reject it, and try to find another scholar who would, might give you a satisfactory answer, until you arrive at a solution of your problem. This is Ibn Hazm's advice, and it seems to me a very sound advice, uh, which makes it obligatory for the person who is asked to reply, I have got this directly from the Quran or the Sunnah, or not. And if he says, Hakadha, I got it in this form from the Quran or the Sunnah, or from both, then it is acceptable. And this does not lead necessarily to uh, imitation of thought, it's called taqlid, which has exerted a very difficult uh, influence, very pernicious influence on Islam <coughs> throughout the centuries. But this is another problem, of course. It's yes. that the other problem that I would like to to take on because historically we all know that the door of ijtihad has been closed for centuries and everybody says it has to be opened again and who closed it uh, i think we can look at both sides of the thing it was closed by muslim scholars uh, Obviously, this would lead to stifling of the Muslim mind in the face of new developments as age goes on, as science progresses, as new situations happen. But on the other hand, we feel that it must have been a defensive mechanism, seeing that tyrants always wanted to make muftis produce a certain fatwa, and through this uh, dictatorship, it was found a protective mechanism to declare that we are followers, we are muqallidun, we close the door of ijtihad, so that rulers wouldn't have access to uh, play about with, with, with religion. But now, it is impossible to keep living in this world and evolving Islamic rulings on the new developments without ijtihad. 
Ijtihad has its very solid foundations even since the day of the Prophet. You remember when he sent Abu Dharr to Yemen mm. and asked him, how are you going to rule? And he said, the book of God. And he asked him, and if you don't find anything in it, then the Sunnah of the Prophet, السلام, then he said, and if you don't find then, he said, I use my creative intelligence. I ajtahid ra'yi wa la alu, and the Prophet was very pleased with that. Nowadays, regrettably, conferences are held to discuss a problem, especially the new scientific problems, that no single mind can have full command of the scientific aspect and the religious aspects. And it is one of the necessities of our time that ijtihad should be based on a communal effort between the, the specialists and the religious scholars. Mm -hmm. But it was my observations that whereas scientists come with the most up-to-date thing, the other camp, the religious scholars, came with what they have in their libraries, <coughs> books that were written hundreds of years ago, <coughs> To them, the older, the better. And they come to say that so-and-so said that, and so-and-so said that. And they were really muqallidun, whereas we wanted to know what do you think on this thing. I, because in the days of, uh, of uh, our predecessors, these issues didn't just exist. And whereas our historical scholars were really mujaddidin, were really creative thinkers, and we're really very up-to-date in this fatwa. Up-to-datedness is outdated if you keep relaying it over the centuries. So we think there must be a, 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 a wide opening of yes. the doors of Ishtihad again. First of all, <clears throat> I don't agree with you that the doors of Ishtihad have ever been closed. This is a concept which has been hammered into the brains of the Muslim community without any justification. All of the great, greatest scholars of Islam, the so-called founders of the various schools of thought, every one of them insisted that his own opinion is not final. Everyone said, if, for example, Imam Abu Hanifa said, if you find in my words anything that offends against the Quran or the, the Sunnah of the Prophet, throw my words to the wind, to the wall, and keep to the Sunnah. This humility of uh, uh, thought was common to all of these great scholars. None of them arrogated to himself the right to make Sharai laws. What they tried to do is to explain Sharai laws to the community at large. And they succeeded in that. That they were followed by other people and their successors invented uh, the slogan of the closed doors of Ijtihad it was not their fault at all. The doors of Ijtihad have never been closed because nobody has the right of closing the doors of Ijtihad. Ijtihad is a God-given uh, possibility to us and the Prophet said very clearly in an authentic uh, narrated in an authentic hadith to us if anyone exercises his own reasoning ijtihad, and arrives at a wrong conclusion God nevertheless rewards him for it and if he arrives at the right conclusion God gives him double reward so it means the exertion of ijtihad by itself is, is a uh, thing recommended by Islam and desired by Islam. Now you have mentioned science. Science has nothing to do with uh, Islamic law. Islamic law, the Sharia, is derived from two sources and two sources only. The Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. Whatever God and the Prophet have intended to be law, they expressed, laid down in terms of law. Do this, don't do that. This is the so-called 
Nas. It is only the Nas of the Quran and the Sunnah which constitutes true Sharia. All conclusions arrived at by deduction or individual speculation are good only for the person who yeah. does them. He may regard them as binding on himself, but nobody can regard another person's conclusions, subjective conclusions, as binding. Even some of them didn't find them mm -hmm. binding for themselves. Mm -hmm. Imam Shafi had his two. Madhab is one in Baghdad and, and yes. one in Cairo. Cairo. Yes. Uh, there is, uh, however, some confusion between what is Sharia and what is Fiqh. Because Sharia is fixed, but Fiqh should be dynamic and mobile. No. And my conclusion is uh, to agree with you that the doors of Ishtihad are open, but let people just step into them because they are refraining to do that. Yes. Now, the difference between Sharia and Fiqh, which, I mean, all, many people confuse the two. Uh -huh. Sharia is the sum total of the laws appearing as laws, injunctive or prohibitive, in the Quran or the Sunnah, authenticated Sunnah of the Prophet. Fiqh, on the other hand, means trying to find the best ways to apply those laws to practical exigencies, to the life of the community, of the individual, and so forth. So fiqh is the, the, way, the uh, way which we must take in order to apply the laws of the Sharia to our lives. Right. It is not, men, uh, this uh, Ibn Qayyim has expressed it very beautifully in Zad al-Ma'ad. He says, nobody has the right to make laws. Shari laws are made by God and his prophet. Yeah. And that's all there is yeah. to it. And laws are only those injunctions or prohibitions which are laid down in terms of law in the Quran or in the Sunnah. In absolutely vahir, obvious, yeah. self-evident form because neither God nor the prophet intended to impose puzzles on us. That's right. They wanted to make clear. Al-haramu bayinun wal halalu bayinun. This is, God made these things clear. And what is not made clear, what is bayinum, what is between the two is doubtful and better to abstain from it. That's right. And that's that.